Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nick Se Cheney. I'm senior fellow and deputy director of the Japan Chair here at CSIS. And on behalf of Dr. Hamry, who unfortunately uh, couldn't make it today, uh, and my CSIS colleagues, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you this afternoon. Delighted to see you all here. Uh, we're also webcasting this event at CSIS.org, and I'd like to welcome our online audience. And for your Twitter fans, we're also tweeting at CSIS, uh, hashtag CSIS Live. <clears throat> uh, so this survey project is a sequel to a survey we conducted in 2008-2009 on Asia's emerging uh, power relations institutions and norms. Uh, that original survey, as well as the one we're discussing today, uh, is on our website. But very briefly, I just thought I'd go through a few of the core findings from our original effort, uh, because I think you'll hear those uh, themes over the course of our discussion today. Uh, the first uh, core finding in our original uh, survey was that there was notional support for the creation of a so-called East Asia community, uh, but that there was also skepticism about the ability of regional institutions to handle security economic or transnational crises. Uh, second core theme was that uh, we found a strong degree of support for the idea that an East Asia community should be based on democratic norms, such as human rights, free and fair elections, and good governance. But there were divisions also about whether states should cede national sovereignty to advance those norms. And in response to questions about regional dynamics, uh, there was a clear assessment that power was shifting to China, uh, but trust was highest toward the United States, uh, with the exception of Thailand, where mistrust of the US was uh, significant. Needless to say, much has transpired in the region since then, uh, and our team here at CSIS decided it would be good to do a follow-up survey uh, to reassess these trends in the region. Uh, and our panel of CSIS scholars here will share some of the results and their analysis in a moment. Uh, but very briefly, I just want to make a few comments uh, about the methodology uh, up front. Like our previous effort, this survey was aimed at strategic elites, uh, which we defined as non-governmental experts who are influential in the debate on international uh, and or Asian regional affairs. Excluded were serving members of the legislative, judicial, or administrative branches of government, and those whose expertise lies outside of international relations or Asia. Uh, this time around, our team uh, identified candidates in Australia, uh, Burma, Myanmar, China, India, Indonesia, Japan, Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, Thailand, uh, and the United States. Uh, and we made a very uh, conscious effort to get a balance uh, range in all of those um, and to get a sense of strategic views uh, across the region. Uh, in collaboration with Opinion Dynamics Corporation, we then developed uh, a, an online survey template, uh, and this survey was fielded electronically between March 24th and April 22nd of, of this year. Uh, <clears throat> out of approximately 1,500 candidates, uh, we generated 402 responses, which was a response rate of about 27%, uh, and that response rate is down, broken down on page five uh, of our report. Uh, I want to note, though, that to allow comparisons across a range of national responses that varied from 23 to 81, uh, we used average values that weight uh, each country equally. Uh, Burma, Myanmar was excluded uh, due to a low response rate, uh, but you'll see that we analyzed that separately uh, in a section at the end of our report. Um, very quickly, just wanted to note that there are some advantages and limitations to this kind of survey sample. Um, you know, this, this is a, a good cross-section of strategic views on power and order in Asia, uh, but the selection of strategic elites is necessarily subjective, uh, and the sample does not necessarily reflect the full range of elite views in the region. Uh, so this type of survey cannot be compared to larger public opinion polls in terms of precision or margin of error. Uh, nonetheless, we're confident that it'll enhance understanding of the strategic landscape in Asia, uh, with respect to power, norms, and regional institutions. Uh, finally, just a few quick words of thanks. Uh, first, we'd like to thank the MacArthur Foundation for supporting this research. Uh, 
Uh, I'd like to acknowledge Ernie Picopoulos, uh, Principal at Opinion Dynamics Corporation for his expert advice and collaboration on this effort. Our media partners, Asahi Shimbun, China Times, and Jungang Ilbo, uh, for their support and assistance in disseminating the results uh, in our survey analysis. Uh, our project director, Dr. Michael Green, as well as our team of Asia scholars. Uh, I'd like to thank Will Colson and Zach Cooper, uh, who really put in a lot of time and effort on this report, uh, as well as a number of staff in the CSIS Asia programs, uh, external relations, and the publications department who helped us design and, and implement this survey. Uh, so without further ado, let me turn it over to Dr. Green. Thank you. Um, thank you, Nick. And Nick really honchoed this effort um, with our uh, media partners and with um, Opinion Dynamics and our partner Ernie Picopolips and within CSIS, so thank you, Nick. Um, we're going to go through the, the major findings that, that we uh, drew from uh, the survey, um, and I'm going to uh, uh, give you uh, nine of them um, and one or two or three graphs for each, and then uh, for each finding I'll ask uh, a colleague or two or three to weigh in on their view of what we're seeing. Um, and then we want to leave time for um, discussion with the audience. Uh, questions, but also comment or insights. Um, this is a survey, in effect, of all of our counterparts in the region. Not all of them, a significant number of our counterparts in the region. Um, we tried very hard to have a balanced pool. We did the surveys uh, in um, Thai, Japanese, Korean, Chinese, and so forth. Um, but uh, as, as Nick said, this is not a a uh, public opinion poll with a scientific margin of error. Um, this is a snapshot or an impression. Some of the results were surprising to us. Some of them confirmed what we're all hearing in the region. Um, but it's really the starting point for a discussion of the dynamics in Asia and, and especially how um, strategic elites, people thinking about the region, um, expect uh, order, power, trade, values to look over the next decade. And so it's a starting point, and your um, comments uh, to us today uh, are frankly as important as what we found in the survey. We want to use this to generate discussion and debate. So please don't come away with the idea that we have a scientific conclusion, game over, uh, you know, the U.S. will lead forever in Asia or something like that. Um, so let me start going through the findings. Um, will Colson's going to put them up. and. Um, we can come back to them later during the discussion if you uh, wanted to ask about a specific uh, survey or um, uh, share an insight on what might explain the result. Uh, you should all have a, um, a binder in front of you with the report. Um, this is the not quite as fancy version uh, we got uh, for today. We'll have a slightly same content, slightly fancier cover in a week or two, and it's on our website as well. Um, the, uh, the first finding. Uh, consistent with uh, our survey uh, four years ago uh, was that uh, experts in the region expect power to shift uh, over the next decade uh, to China. Um, next slide, Will. So um, this is in your packet as well, but um, as you can see, um, the, uh, uh, on balance, the view across the region when we averaged uh, or weighted for each country was that um, power uh, that China would exert um, the most power in Asia in 10 years. Um, there were two, at least two, really interesting uh, responses, though. If you look on the left, um, you'll see that s those who disagreed with this notion were primarily Chinese and American experts. 71% of the Chinese respondents said that the U.S., uh, in fact, would exert the greatest power in East Asia in a decade, and a Similar number, 68% of the Americans agreed. Um, U.S. allies, Japan, Korea, um, Australia tended to be that way, and then um, uh, other countries we surveyed um, expected more of a power shift uh, to Asia. Um, so I'm going to come to our experts in a second, but that result is not completely surprising, the sense that power is shifting to Asia, but the Chinese response and perhaps the American response uh, were a bit unexpected. Um, next slide. We, um, we asked a number of questions. Um, about uh, uh, China's impact on the region um, and found, on average, 79% of respondents thought uh, that China would uh, exert a very positive or positive uh, 
impact um, economically, um, but 61 percent across the region uh, expected that China would exert a, a bad or very bad influence on the security developments. Um, the um, blue uh, column shows the expectations for those who said uh, uh, China would have a very positive or somewhat positive impact on economics. The red security, you'll note that only, in only one country did um, a majority of respondents say China will have a good impact on regional security. That was China, 83% of the experts. Um, across the rest of the region, much lower, particularly low uh, in the US and Japan. And then the third one, for this particular uh, grouping of findings. Next slide. Yes, thanks, Will, that's it. Uh, which of the following countries do you think will be your country's most important economic partner in 10 years? And this obviously is part of the explanation for those countries that found Japan would, excuse me, China would exert the most influence. <clears throat> um, leading the list, uh, Taiwan, um, followed um, noticeably by Korea and Australia. Um, if you look to the right of this chart, you'll see the outliers. Um, Japan and Japanese experts, 71% uh, uh, said that uh, the United States in 10 years would be Japan's most important economic partner. My first reaction to this was that it was wishful thinking in Japanese think tanks, <laughs> nervous about China. But as I talked, I was in Japan uh, uh, this last week, as I talked to CEOs and economic planners, um, I think sometimes in the US we miss how much Japanese companies are interested in American shale gas, infrastructure, energy. So I think this, in my view, and, and Matt and others may want to weigh in, this actually may be a, not just wishful thinking, but a fairly accurate perception of, of, of where the U.S.-Japan economic relationship might be in 10 years. But the particularly striking one was China, where 83 percent of Chinese experts said, um, not surprising when you think about it, but 83 percent of Chinese experts said the U.S. would be their most economic uh, economically important partner, and this included Canada, the EU, and others. To me, that's quite striking. It suggests that there's a lot more recognition in Beijing among elites of how important the U.S. is uh, than perhaps there is in other parts of Asia, um, that other parts of Asia may not appreciate how much the U.S. and China economically have of a stake in each other, and particularly how much Chinese experts view their stake in economic relations with the U.S. So for some commentary, uh, from colleagues on this first set of findings. Let me ask um, uh, Chris uh, and Rick and Victor. Chris is our Freeman Chair on China Studies. Rick is our Wadwani Chair on U.S. India. Uh, and Victor is our Korea Chair. Um, let's start with you, Chris. Um, I think, I guess, I suppose the first thing to point out is from the first slide where, obviously, you have this large number of Chinese respondents uh, that is suggesting that the U.S. will exert the greatest power. Uh, I personally didn't find this to be a terribly uh, shocking response, but I think it does highlight a couple of things. The first is that I think it's emblematic of what we're seeing uh, if you look at the arc from the global financial crisis and now moving forward uh, as we kind of get back toward a more steady equilibrium in U.S.-China perceptions of themselves and each other. Uh, I think after the global financial crisis, there was a very strong perception in China that uh, they had found some third way and that their rise was inevitable and the U.S. was in either, you know, seriously had stumbled or was already in permanent decline. I think those assessments have started to even out uh, as the U.S. has done better economically, as the shale oil and gas revolution takes place, and most importantly, I think, affecting these numbers are deepening concerns inside the Chinese system about their own ability to maintain the robust economic growth that they've been uh, witnessing over the last several years, especially as the reform process that they're going through now is really beginning to bite, and uh, you're getting a much more solid understanding, I think, across Chinese elites that that's going to be a very difficult process, and there'll be some bumps in the road. I think the second reason why we see that number, again, is um, tells us the story to some degree of this debate within China about what kind of China does China want to be, uh, and how are they going to comport themselves on the international stage, and so on. And, so that number reflects to me that it's still this sense of we're still sorting that out. So the U.S. you know will continue to play the the same role that it has been in terms of leading. And then I think most importantly that slide also really gives the lie, if you will, to this notion that all Chinese are just brimming with hubris and and assertiveness and aggressiveness. Um, clearly that doesn't isn't reflected here. And then on the second slide, I just wanted to make um, a comment. Will, can you move to the second one? Uh, yeah, so the numbers I take from this one I think is quite interesting is that for Sino-U.S. relations, the implications here are 
we need to focus on the economic pieces of the relationship, not the security stuff, right? And we're going through this right now uh, with cyber and everything else that we've witnessed here in the last couple of weeks. I was just in Beijing, and when I came, conversations I had there is abundantly clear to me that too much emphasis on trying to solve very difficult, intractable security problems when, in fact, they should probably be being managed and not enough emphasis on trying to look at the economic pieces of the bilateral relationship where, in fact, there may be some solutions. Well, from the India perspective, I mean, you, you see that uh, India uh, looks at uh, China's rise as the regional power, um, and, and they see that as, uh, as the uh, most likely scenario at among the highest levels uh, across all of Asia, and they do have concerns about what that means for the region. At the same time, they're, uh, they're one of only two countries in the region, Japan being the other, that view that the United States will be their, economic, their strongest economic partner in 10 years. So I presume that uh, the new prime minister in India, Mr. Narendra Modi, has probably seen this data that we prepared. And uh, that is painting his administration's uh, outlook in foreign affairs so far. Because you look at the steps that he's taken. I mean, there was a, there was a lot of uh, hair pulling. Uh, you can see that I was active in that before. On whether or not the, uh, um, the, the, the denial of uh, the revocation of Mr. Modi's visa 10 years ago would paint his perceptions about the United States, whether we would have a warm welcome when he was, uh, when he was uh, if and when he was elected. Uh, and indeed, you know, actually, I think that the, uh, the, the steps for outreach that the U.S. has taken so far have been uh, reciprocated uh, as warmly as can be expected. In fact, you know, there's rumors going on right now, I don't know if the other side has confirmed it, that he may actually come uh, to Washington uh, later this year. So um, I think he looks at this same things that, that the experts in India picked up here. Um, China is going to be the big power. Um, they're concerned about that rise, and the United States will be their top economic partner. Uh, and Modi's not going to want to wait for that future. Uh, he's a pragmatic guy, and the day that he's in office, if that's what he thinks the future is going to look like, let's start rushing towards that right now. So I think so far, uh, I think this kind of, uh, this sort of sentiments are, are painting what he's been doing so far. Um, well, if you can go to the third slide. Is that the third slide? Yeah, okay. Um, so if, um, from the Korean perspective, if you look at this, I mean, to me what's so interesting is you see Korea there at 86%, seeing China as the most important economic partner, and then just on, way on the other side of the graph is Japan that has almost a completely the reverse view of their economic future partner. And I think for Korea, what this, I mean, Korea is very schizophrenic, or perhaps even bipolar when it comes to China. And, and I think um, the set of charts really do show that because on the one hand, they acknowledge the objective reality that uh, China is their most important economic partner. But then on um, figure two, if you look as to the question of whether they like the fact that China is their most important economic partner, um, you know, whether China has a positive impact, um, you know, their, their numbers are pretty high there, but they're still lower than the United States, Australia, Singapore, Thailand, in fact, even lower than China. Um, so again, that just shows to me that the, the Koreans, on the one hand, there's this objective reality that they acknowledge China is their key economic partner. But whether they're entirely happy about that um, is not at all clear. Furthermore, not to step ahead, Mike, but in, in the next set of charts you'll, you'll, you, that you're going to be showing, you'll see when it comes to the question of how Korea feels about U.S. leadership, um, in the future, they're way off the charts in terms of positive support. So, you know, it's a very sort of conflicted and schizophrenic view. Thanks. So the second finding we broadly took away was in spite of this perception of a shift in relative power towards, towards uh, China, um, there are strong expectations among regional experts we interviewed, or excuse me, we surveyed that on a regional basis, U.S. leadership will remain strong. Um, and in this uh, next slide, you'll see we asked uh, the expectations of these experts over the next decade, and we gave them um, five different scenarios. Um, continued U.S. leadership, even if relative U.S. power declines. Uh, an uneasy balance of power among the major, major regional states, but with no one state dominant. Um, the yellow bar is a new community of nations based on strength in multilateral institutions and cooperation. Uh, the red bar is Chinese primacy, and then the um, bottom bar, I think that's gold, is uh, a U.S.-China condominium. You hear a lot of talk about all these scenarios in the region. I'm sure you have. You've read about them. But when we asked 
our experts in the region to choose, um, the strongest answer um, was that the first one, that there would be continued U.S. leadership. And as Victor noted, especially in Korea, um, generally among U.S. allies, uh, in China, um, whereas uh, Thailand, Indonesia, um, less certainty about that. Then we asked uh, which of these five scenarios would be in the best interests of your country in, a, in the next 10 years. Um, you know, Japan, no doubt about it, U.S. leadership. Um, Japanese are even more sure of that than Americans are. Um, and then the U.S. allies and partners. Um, it's interesting that uh, India, uh, China, to a lesser extent, Indonesia, Thailand, in other words, especially South and Southeast Asia, had a preference for a community of nations um, uh, based on uh, multilateral cooperation. Um, there was not a lot of appetite for a balance of power among the major states, presumably India, Australia, Korea, Japan. Not much appetite for that, very little appetite uh, for Sinocentric system and very, almost no appetite for a U.S.-China condominium. Um, most respondents had strong preferences, and one thing that jumped out here was that in China, there was quite a diffuse mix. It, it, clearly, not a lot of enthusiasm for U.S. leadership, but not a strong preference or consensus among the Chinese experts about what sort of regional order they'd, they'd prefer instead. So let me ask for comment on that uh, to Bonnie and uh, Ernie. Well, on the first slide, I think that the, there is recognition in uh, China, as uh, Chris was saying earlier, of persisting uh, U.S. lead, particularly in comprehensive national power. Uh, the Chinese, especially the strategic elites that we interviewed, uh, excuse me, surveyed, I, th I think don't share this public opinion in China that when China overtakes the United States in aggregate GDP, uh, that that will necessarily mean uh, that uh, China's uh, power is going to be greater overall uh, than the United States. So I think that's one point. Uh, secondly, I think that the Chinese are really not ready uh, to take on leadership themselves. Uh, it's widely seen in China that uh, getting too entangled abroad, uh, getting distracted from their major task of increasing their own uh, economic power uh, domestically, uh, that this is not necessarily in uh, Chinese interest. At the same time, it's quite clear that they are uh, uncomfortable, if you go to the next slide, uh, with the notion of uh, U.S. leadership. Uh, so you do see uh, relatively small numbers of Chinese that support continued U.S. leadership. Um, another comment that I would make is, uh, yes, it, there's quite diffuse views in China as to what kind of, uh, of power they would like to see uh, in, in Asia. Uh, community of nations is certainly uh, among, I think, uh, scholars, think tank experts, is the preference. But note that there is greater support, more than 20 percent, for a U.S.-China condo condominium than in any other country. And I think that this is the way a new type of major power relationship is, in fact, viewed in China. Um, this is Xi Jinping's notion that he has put forward. Um, it's not quite uh, explicitly referenced as a G2 arrangement, uh, but I do think it re reflects China's preference for being treated as an equal with the United States and sharing power. For Southeast Asia, um, what we can see here is that the Southeast Asians uh, understand uh, balance and consensus. That's their priority. Um, and, and we take the findings in these slides uh, with the earlier slides. What, what, there's a clear message for U.S. strategy here, if, if we did have one, um, and that would be that economics in Asia is security. Uh, I would really underline that point. Um, for the Southeast Asians, uh, they cannot imagine a regional economic framework that doesn't include China and they can't imagine a regional security framework that doesn't include the United States. They want both of us uh, included. Um, I think the things that could change these lines of trajectory um, are, uh, are the, would be a U.S. failure uh, to move forward with a, a, a comprehensive economic um, strategy for Asia. That's TPP and beyond. TPP would not be sufficient, uh, in my view. And and or a Chinese failure uh, on the security side. Um, Southeast Asia is responding very negatively to increased Chinese aggression uh, in, on the South China Sea uh, and 
up north, and there's a lot of concern about that. So what we're seeing here is a, a strong indicator, a strong pull for the, from the Southeast Asians and a comfort level with regional frameworks uh, being built to manage uh, these relationships. Notable, a uh, Malaysian uh, diplomat once told me um, that the genius of ASEAN was that it took Indonesia, which was uh, in the 60s, the big boy in the neighborhood who no one really understood. They didn't know what the Indonesians wanted or what the Indonesians wanted to be. And they created a framework, ASEAN, in which the Indonesians could have um, a lot of face, uh, a lot of room uh, to be the, the BAPAK or the big, uh, the big player, uh, and, and then eventually co-opt the Indonesians into making the rules and playing by the rules in the neighborhood. And that is exactly what the answer the Southeast Asians want to use to manage China's uh, emergence on the um, regional and global stage. Thanks. The, um, the third broad finding we had uh, was that there is um, a broad support for the U.S. rebalance, also known as the pivot, uh, but concern about implementation. Um, the next chart, we show this both in a bar graph and in a heat map uh, of the region. Um, uh, green is enthusiastic, red is opposed. So this looks a little bit like, I think, some of our Chinese friends' image of containment strategy, but that's not what it's intended to show. What it shows is the view of the rebalance, 79% on average across the region, um, but only 23% of the Chinese respondents had a positive view. Um, but China's really an outlier. Um, every other country, there was strong support for the rebalance. Um, in the US, 96%. So CSIS scholars were not, were not allowed to answer the survey, but we, we tried very hard to have a, a balance across town. So I don't know who, but this means our friends at Heritage or AEI, who have not always been as charitable to the administration, uh, uh, I would say broadly support the rebalance. So this, to me, should be a sign uh, to our friends in the region that this has bipartisan uh, legs and that um, with maybe one or two exceptions we won't say on the record, uh, pretty much um, any candidate going into 2016 uh, is going to keep doing this. Uh, uh, various polls, not ours, but public opinion polls show that now consistently a majority of Americans say Asia is the most important region in the world to us. So the 96% support for the US I think is actually um, maybe the most surprising part of this and it's good because a lot of us up here feel the, that the rebalance should, uh, should continue. Um, now when we asked about how it's going or how would you characterize the rebalance on the next slide, um, it's a little more mixed result for the administration. Um, we broke these into the four answers um, and what you find is that um, in the upper left, uh, one, one characterization was, would you, would you describe the rebalance as too confrontational towards China? Nobody took that bait. Almost no country responded that way, except in China, where there was a very strong response that the rebalance is too confrontational to China. But, but that was only in China. And I think it's important to recognize that um, the, over half of the respondents' view was, um, there just needs to be more of it, insufficient resources and implementation. We could go round and round about why that is. Um, it's particularly strongly felt among US allies. Matt pointed out earlier um, uh, among TPP partners. So part of it is probably um, a lack of satisfaction at progress on TPP in this town. Um, I suspect part of it is concern about the defense budget here. Um, you don't have to read too far into the Japanese, Korean, or Australian media to see that there's concern about uh, Syria and what that meant. Um, and, uh, and frankly, whether the second uh, uh, term uh, uh, of President Obama has people who are as committed as the first term, some of this is impressionistic. Um, but the bottom line is um, uh, the entire region wants us to do this, thinks it's important, uh, but we have a problem in China. So let me ask for some, some comments. Uh, 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 actually, why don't, we, why don't we move on to that? I just want to ask Rick to comment on the India part, because India's response to the rebalance is interesting. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I, I think 10 years ago, we didn't have a term for it. We didn't call it the pivot back then. But I, I think, you know, those of us that are so buried in just US-India uh, only uh, saw uh, about 10 years ago a real pivot towards India. 
Uh, we didn't we didn't call it that same thing at the time, but it really was. And you know, for a variety of reasons, but most importantly because of how India handled uh, the liability law uh, for civilian nuclear liability, uh, a little bit of interest was lost. And so those of us that are stuck in the U.S.-India vein look at the rebalance towards Asia uh, as though uh, a little bit less attention in the region on India. And so again, for the U.S.-India folks, the rebalance in some ways you know gives India a little bit less attention. But interestingly, that India had actually above higher support. People in India had above higher support for the rebalance because for them. It's not just about having a love fest with the United States. Uh, it's about their own regional security, and they're more concerned, as, as, as we show in our, in our data as well, on there actually being you know, hot warfare, potentially, because of regional issues, because of border issues. So for them, it's not about a one-on-one -on -one relationship or anything like that, but anything that puts more attention on the region there and creates a more stable environment, uh, India is very supportive of. Our fourth broad finding was that um, experts in the region uh, clearly view territorial confrontations as the major obstacle to regional community building. And as Nick noted, we did the survey in 2009 with the support of MacArthur Foundation. They also were um, very supportive and um, uh, both um, in content and budget for this uh, effort as well. In 2009, we asked a lot of questions about institutions. Um, and, we, and then we asked questions we call the Ghostbuster questions. Who are you going to call? So if there's a financial crisis, a pandemic, a, uh, a, a proliferation problem of who, who are you going to call? And we listed all the institutions, APEC, ARF, you know. And what we found was even the most ardent East Asia community builders in Asia were not about to call the ARF or the ASEAN plus three if there was a crisis. They were going to call the IMF, the Seventh Fleet. Um, uh, so we didn't ask those same questions because there was such a strong skepticism about the utility of these institutions beneath a very robust support for trying to do them. Um, you can be very for community building uh, as a long-range goal and be very skeptical about whether you'd really rely on it. That's what we found. So this time we asked a little different question. We said, um, uh, it's not here, we, but we asked how is the East Asia community building going? And uh, you know, a majority of respondents said moderately well. And then we asked what are the major obstacles? And uh, on average across the region, is, it's a little hard to see, it's in your packet. Uh, on average, it was territorial issues. Um, and history issues that ranked number one, um, followed by uncertainty about China. Um, and um, they're not wrong, because I want to show you the second slide, which was, uh, to me, quite striking. When we asked on this question of uh, territorial problems, if, if another country seized your sovereign territory and assuming that diplomacy didn't resolve the crisis, would you support uh, military force to retake your territory? So for Americans, you know, 88%, you know, uh, Koreans, 86%. It was all quite high. But the one that jumps out here is Japan. 81% of Japanese experts said that um, they would support um, military force. Um, and although we didn't mention the Senkaku, Daoyudao, Daoyutai, I think that's clearly what was in people's minds. So these territorial issues are um, uh, more than we found in 2009, really in the forefront of the entire region's uh, view of what's in the way of more cooperation. Um, and as this poll shows, you know, there's, there's some reason for that. Um, I want to ask a couple people to talk about these, because these disputes, of course, are all across the region. So let me turn um, to, uh, to Chris and Bonnie and Murray. Um, I would just point out uh, that I think the numbers for China really aren't that surprising. I mean, I mean my feeling is that this reflects the, not only the messaging that we're seeing coming out of the Chinese government, but also the behavior under the new Chinese leadership. And it is a good reminder that uh, while it can be taken too far to suggest that the leadership is constantly under pressure, you know, from their own society on these issues, it's certainly a factor. I mean, a lead opinion obviously is very uh, pointed in one direction on that. Obviously, the Chinese government has done that to themselves through stoking those nationalist sentiments uh, over the years to uh, legitimize the system. But uh, I think it does suggest to us that uh, there's not going to be too many audiences in China should a, an accident or something occur who are saying, hey, wait a minute, let's take a, a pause here, or worse, if something was, you know, an effort was made to seize their territory. Well, clearly on the history question, uh, what the Chinese are saying here is that the, the problem is Japan, 
um, that is no surprise. Uh, there's obviously been uh, very much a consensus in China that when it comes to history issues, that an obstacle to community building in East Asia, in their view, uh, is because Japan has not uh, resolved uh, and acknowledged its role in history. Um, on the territorial issues, I think that what the Chinese are thinking about here is that uh, there is a, in their view, a sense that the U.S. Uh, rebalance is emboldening uh, nations of the region to challenge China's uh, territorial claims. I think that's what they have in their minds there. Um, and on the, uh, on the second slide, I think what we see uh, in this, of course, you know, throughout the region, not just in China, uh, real support for using military uh, force if uh, you're, if the uh, if in their uh, 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 territory were were, uh, were attacked, I, I think that uh, really what we see is whether it's in Scarborough Shoal or Second Thomas Shoal uh, or the recent oil rig that the Chinese have positioned uh, off the coast of the Paracels and Vietnam. Uh, that there really is just widespread support uh, for these actions and for asserting China's claims uh, more forcefully. So again, I think that they, they support what their nation is doing and are critical uh, of what other nations are doing and what they see as U.S. support for challenging China. Can we go back to the first slide? I'll talk a little bit about, uh, about Southeast Asia. It's really interesting. You see the average is 7.9 uh, out of a on a scale of 1 to 10, the average is 7.9, concern about, uh, about uh, territorial confrontations. But the highest two, there's a tie, Indonesia and Singapore, both are 8.4. They're the highest score on, in the whole grouping. And Thailand is 7.3, the lowest score uh, in, the, in, in all of these countries. And I, I guess, uh, you know, the reason that you would th uh, expect that, that this would be the case is that Indonesia and Singapore uh, probably are, you know, they're on the edge of the conflict or the, um, the disputes in the South China Sea. Uh, they would be most affected if there is a dispute. Its trade would be most easily disrupted. Well, on the other hand, Thailand, this, this uh, survey was taken before the coup, but in the middle of, uh, middle of the seven-month uh, political unrest ahead of the coup, and the Thais have are clearly been internally focused for quite some time, but they're also the furthest away uh, from the from the, dis, uh, the dispute in the South China Sea, and probably so the least affected. Then, if you go to the next slide, it's these numbers are borne out again. Uh, Singapore and Indonesia are very uh, very high numbers for uh, supporting military force if diplomacy fails. While Thailand, it's only 61 percent. And again, I think that's uh, 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 you know, based on their perception. Their their threats are internal mostly at this point. Uh, in their view, and uh, so the external threats are, are probably minimized as a result. Hey, hey Mike, can I just real quick on this? Uh, you know, I, I mentioned it briefly upstairs, but it really, you know, when you see it presented in this graph, when I saw the raw data, it didn't really jump out at me, but, you know, getting back to India, when you look at the countries here, oh, sorry, on the first slide, the countries uh, that are named specifically as uh, will these be obstacles to community building in East Asia, so there's three that are mentioned in there that are also polled. China, and China ranks itself the lowest as a threat to community building. Japan, Japan ranks itself lowest. India, India ranks itself middle of the road. So it considers itself actually in the, the upper half as an obstacle, obstacle to community building in East Asia. So uh, I'm not sure exactly what drove response to say that, but they certainly have a pretty high opinion about what they plan on doing in East Asia in the future here. So. Uh, the, the fifth broad finding was on this question of, uh, of history. And while the territorial issues were um, ranked very high all across the region as an obstacle to community building as a concern, uh, history was particularly acute as an issue in Northeast Asia. Um, on, on this slide, uh, you'll see that we asked, um, uh, and Victor and I spent a long time trying to figure out how we could, in one or two questions, try to capture how elites thinking about security and economics would describe the nature of these historical disputes. So we gave them uh, four options. Um, that it could be a source of diplomatic conflict, but not military. Uh, the green line, that it could be a source of military conflict. Um, yellow, it just doesn't apply. And then uh, red, it's a political nuisance, but it's not going to be diplomatic or military. Now, India stands out here because I think for the Indian experts, its own neighborhood, especially Pakistan, um, drove the answer. Um, 
most countries, the, the, the leading answer was that these his, history disputes, disputes over how you interpret history, would be a source of diplomatic but not military conflict. Both the Japanese and Korean experts uh, felt that. Um, uh, China stands out a bit, though. Uh, Chinese experts were more evenly divided with a significant number thinking that it could be a source of, uh, of military uh, conflict. So I wanted Victor to try to unbundle this one for us. Um, well, in the case of Korea, quite obviously, you know, if it's all about Japan. Um, Korea was one of the few countries, if not the only country in the survey that rated uh, historical obstacles. His history is an obstacle to East Asian community higher than uncertainty about a rising China. Um, and, um, uh, and, and very clearly, uh, they see uh, lots of concerns with Japan. What is interesting, however, and I don't know if we're, we're not at the next slide yet, um, but what's interesting, however, is when we, when we look at, um, can we go to the next Will, one? Well, you can go to the next one. It's um, how this concerned one, are you right. about the following challenges? What's yeah. interesting is if you, so Korea, obviously the historical issues are about Japan, but when you look at this slide and you look at Japan and Korea side by side, if you look at almost all of these other issues, climate change, nuclear proliferation, terrorism, you go down the list, with the exception of nat natural disasters, Korea and Japan are almost equivalent in terms of their concerns about all of these issues. They nearly, they nearly mirror each other. So I think that is really the picture of Japan-Korea relations as a really difficult problem with regard to history. Thankfully, uh, both the uh, Koreans and the Japanese don't see that as a source of uh, military conflict, largely as a source of diplomatic conflict. But at the same time, across the broad range of issues, Japanese and Koreans share very similar views. They have, they have very, a very strong overlap of interest on a lot of practical issues. Mike, uh, just to add on, on Southeast Asia, you know, history is not, not a major concern. Uh, you can see on the, from the first slide, um, political nuisance, but not likely a cause of conflict. Um, I think that's important because um, this, in response to Prime Minister Abe's uh, speech at the Shangri-La uh, about Jap Japan wanting to, or being willing to um, support um, uh, the modernization and, and capacity building in militaries around the region in Southeast Asia, the, the Southeast Asians don't carry a lot of baggage uh, from World War II on that. And then they're very, uh, I think, very open to it. They want to be careful uh, not to send the wrong s signals and provoke China, but I think they're willing to take up that Japanese offer. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. We, um, if you sort of compare this with public opinion polling about Japan um, in Asia, uh, you know, in South and Southeast Asia, Japan gets over well over 90% positive ratings. Um, on the other hand, we didn't ask the exact same question that we did last time but the overall uh, unease about Japan is also a little higher this time. So it's, it, cuts, it cuts both ways. But um, the Shangri-La um, presentation by Prime Minister Abe was, was well received with one very important exception, uh, as those who were there know. Yeah. Can I just say one other yeah, the, the other thing worth mentioning on, on this chart, the, the chart on the screen right now, is if you look at the country, the country that feels it doesn't apply to them the most is the United States. <laughs> And, and that could be a reading, a, a literal reading of the question in the sense that Americans don't feel that they have a lot of historical issues with the countries in the region, or it could be read as they're just not interested, uh, one or the other. Uh, although a literal reading of the question would lead you to believe they're responding to the notion that there aren't a lot of historical issues between the United States and the countries in the region. Or, or it's just a message yeah. to everybody, we're tired of this issue. Yeah, we don't care. <laughs> right. um, I'm going to combine the next two before I turn to the panel, but let me uh, turn to finding six. We asked, you know, we asked earlier, what are the obstacles to community building? This is a slightly different question. What worries you the most? Um, number one across the region, uh, economic and financial crises. I'll turn to Matt in a second on that. Um, number two across the region, territory and history. Climate change, um, still, uh, still pretty high. Um, except in the U.S., uh, but in certain parts of Asia, it's, it's a concern, a security concern that's, that's quite high. Um, North Korea, excuse me, South Korea sort of stood and Japan out from the rest of the region in their concern about North Korea. Um, so it's a bit of a mishmash. I mean, what people are really worried about varies uh, across the region. 
Um, but, the, but the financial crises, that's pretty much common across the region, especially in developing parts of Asia um, and the territorial uh, and history disputes. Um, turning to finding uh, seven, um, uh, since uh, economic crises and economic concerns were paramount, um, uh, in terms of challenges, I think it's important to look at how experts view the future of economic frameworks in this region. Um, the next slide, if you could, Will. We gave them a lot of options. This isn't all of them. Um, uh, and asking them how important is the success of each of these following economic frameworks to your country's future. Um, if you look um, at the ranking across uh, the region, um, uh, you'll find that trans-Pacific uh, uh, formulas are really quite dominant. Um, APEC, um, you know, a few years ago, people were writing off APEC, if you'll recall the debate. Um, uh, I tease Matthew Goodman because the response now that he's out of government about APEC is much higher than when he was working on it. But, but that could also be a, a sort of lag time effect of his good work. Um, G20. Um, quite uh, strong support for G20. Um, the ASEAN economic community is high because for ASEAN members it's very high. Um, but then the next one is TPP. So, um, you know, at one point, there, and still there's been debate, you know, are we looking to a decoupling where we're going to have uh, RCEP, which is listed um, uh, a sixth here or fifth, uh, RCEP versus TPP, some sort of division. Um, it's, it doesn't come out in the expert surveys. Um, there's a pretty heavy weighting, it seems towards an architecture that's trans-Pacific and inclusive. Of course, we have to get TPP right and a few other things, but this, I think, is generally encouraging news for the US. Um, let me ask Matt to, to, um, to sort of deal with both of these, economic crisis concern and the, and the uh, framework that people see uh, as most important for their country's future. Sure. Well, I mean, I think this is this chart is encouraging if it really reflects broader um, elite opinion, including among you know official policymakers in the region. As Mike said, it, it shows that there is interest and support for uh, these broader um, these broader trans-Pacific and even global uh, institutions. Um, I'm obviously am particularly uh, overjoyed to see APEC score so highly, since I usually call it the Rodney Dangerfield of U.S. foreign policy, because it doesn't get enough respect. But uh, it shows that people think it is a useful part of the architecture, uh, at least this uh, this group as surveyed. Um, and you know, even China, admittedly, they're hosting APEC this year, so that may bump those scores up a little bit. But um, China seems to appreciate these um, uh, these institutions. Um, and so I think that's all positive, and I think it does reflect more broadly that when we say that there are these schisms between people interested in one track or another track, I think we have to be careful about that because uh, that may not be so much about uh, the substance of these um, undertakings, in other words, whether TPP or RCEP is really the, the better approach to, um, to regional economic integration, but more about kind of who's sitting in the big chair with the microphone and the gavel. Um, uh, so I think uh, this may reflect, hopefully, the, the real story um, about the substance. On the previous slide, um, I, I think probably, uh, particularly because of the, and Murray might want to comment on this, uh, the, 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 the scoring in the uh, Southeast Asian countries uh, on regional economic and financial crises, you know, I assume this is a legacy of the 1997 a crisis, a uh, financial crisis in Asia, and, and of course the more recent crisis. And then just generally, you know, it's the economy, stupid. I think that's what people, really policymakers, are, are worried about as short-term challenges uh, more broadly. So that's, that's probably why it scores so high. Ernie or Marie? Thanks. Uh, I think you're absolutely right, Mike, that uh, the, the 97 financial crisis still weighs heavily on people's minds. Um, I also want to just talk a little bit about the, the TPP and how Southeast Asians respond to it, because uh, I think that's the next slide, right? Uh, it's uh, in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, uh, the average w score was 75. Uh, the, what's interesting, Singapore, is, which is a member of the TPP, scored it very high at 82. Thailand, which is not a member uh, and pre-coup government, had, had the, the, the administration had looked at trying to join TPP in the second tranche. In Indonesia, uh, however, is only at, at 43 percent. Indonesia, if, if you follow it, has been introducing some fairly uh, nationalistic protectionist measures over the last couple of years. They think their time has come. They need to keep 
what's in Indonesia for the Indonesians, and uh, so they, they rank it, uh, the, the TPP, very low. However, in the uh, Regional Comprehensive Partnership, what's interesting, the score is almost the same uh, on the, in the regional average, but Indonesia, which only gave 43% uh, rating to the TPP, gives the RCEP 74%, and Thailand uh, is roughly in the same place it was on the TPP at 75%, and Singapore also at 83%, at, uh, which is roughly the same. So there's, there's a, cons outside of Indonesia, there is a, a broad consensus that the uh, economic architecture, the trade architecture that's being hammered out is, is worthy of support. I mean, the, po the, po the point here, Mike, is that, um, you know, I just want to make this again, because I think we sort of missed this in our trade or economic policy. Asia doesn't see a, an integrated Asian, a, a future of uh, Asian economic integration that excludes China. Uh, it, it's not going to happen, and I think we have to get our heads around that. Um, and, and I know China is uh, open or are eligible and invited to join the TPP if they want to. But um, I think we really have to reconceptualize, you know, what do we new, do next beyond the TPP uh, to have a, a, a comprehensive strategy. The other thing that is, I think, just screams out from this chart is that for a lot of Asia, economics is the foundation of security. Um, and so these things are, these are, are very tightly linked uh, in the minds of our, our partners uh, in the region. I would just add quickly that um, if you look at Taiwan, it wants to be in everything it can. Maybe this is the point you're about to make, Bonnie. <laughs> um, yeah. Obviously, it can't be in the ASEAN economic community, but Taiwan wants in. <laughs> right. I, There's I a way to just, do it. I was just going to make the point that uh, Taiwan clearly wants to be included in something. Uh, it is excluded <laughs> from all of these, uh, these uh, multilateral organizations, but it's really um, notable that 100 percent support TPP, uh, support RCEP. Uh, Taiwan just clearly wants to be included. Um, two more, if you'll bear with me. Uh, uh, finding eight, we've uh, found robust support for regional, uh, in the region for uh, democratic values, um, except in the U.S. where the support declined considerably since our last survey. We, we asked um, last time um, for our respondents to rank um, the priorities for creation of an East Asia community over the course of 10 years. <clears throat> um, next slide, Will. This is the current one but it was the same questions. And not surprisingly, the top priorities were establishing a uh, framework for trade and regional economic integration, um, and then uh, confidence building, preventing conflict. Um, last time, 2009, it jumped out at us that the next priorities were all um, uh, about good governance, human rights, free and fair elections, rule of law. Um, and so one of the headlines for us last time, it really was quite striking, was how much in Asia um, with the exception of China, but even in China, about half the respondents were, um, were supportive. And of course, you have to allow for interpretation of what these terms mean in each country. But there was quite uh, robust support for um, a, a, an East Asian uh, norm or set of norms around these, these issues, with the important caveat that China, Indonesia, India, um, uh, you know, non-aligned, uh, post-colonial, and other states uh, said non-interference in internal affairs is also important. Um, uh, this time, the, the broad support uh, went up a bit, but, um, next slide, Will, but among Americans it dropped, among the American experts. Um, I've sort of pondered what this means. Seems to me that um, uh, with, the, with the question of tactics on how you improve good governance, democracy, and women's empowerment aside, and that's a big question, this is a region that generally is, you know, quite different from the Middle East. Um, and that this ought to be part of the American playbook. And yet, American experts have lost a little of their uh, shine about these things. It could be because of our own experience as Americans with the Middle East, which has been pretty darn disappointing over the last decade. Uh, it could be that it's, um, as the Washington Post suggested in an article today, it just isn't part of the narrative from the president as much in, as in the past. Could be a post rock hangover, who knows? It does strike me as a, um, something of a lost opportunity for Americans to think about um, uh, how um, this, uh, this region, unlike, uh, say, the Middle East, which we think about a lot, generally is a good story uh, on, on, on uh, democracy, good governance. And over half of the respondents everywhere supported, uh, including these, in East Asia community building in our regional dialogue. Um, I'm going to then, if I, if I uh, uh, Ernie, you wanted to say something on this? 
I, I would just say, you know, there's been some, I, I think, sort of very superficial analysis of late, uh, you know, suggesting that Asia is going backwards on uh, democratic values um, and human rights, and and you know, they're pointing at things like the coup in Thailand, and um, it, you know, there are things to point at that would suggest. Uh, a challenge to that, but I, I see something completely different, particularly in Southeast Asia. Uh, what I see is an assertion of a growing and empowered and connected middle class uh, that really is um, pushing uh, the envelope, pushing for the development of institutions, and they are they are asking for more participation, better governance, and so I see I see the you know sort of an uptick on the democracy, um, human rights, governance interests there. Well, it would be interesting to see um, how, you know, uh, some of the current uh, uh, political situations work out. But I suspect, for instance, in a place like Thailand, that uh, both polls, you know, there's very partisan uh, or, or polar um, approach in Thailand right now. I suspect what we'll see, I don't know over what period of time, you know, between two and ten years, the rise of a moderate middle, uh, and I think we're going to see that. We see that happen in Indonesia, and I wonder, you know, whether that's not going to be a trend that impacts places like um, China uh, in the future. So I, I think this is something, I didn't find it a very interesting finding and uh, one that we should really think about uh, strategically. Over half of the American respondents said these were important issues, but on women's empowerment and human rights, uh, Americans were last, below China. <laughs> Um, and Koreans were pretty low on, on, on women's empowerment. Uh, on other democratic norms, they were quite high. So it's, it's you know, it's, it's thought-provoking. Um, I'm still trying to make sense of it, but um, something especially for Americans to ponder. Last but not least, we asked about Taiwan. Um, you can just put the slide up and I'll let Bonnie explain this one. If Taiwan were reunified with China through coercive means, what would be the impact on your country's interests? Uh, clearly, we did not simply ask the question if it were peacefully unified. And we might have gotten very different questions, uh, diff excuse me, very different answers. But this to me is very significant. 99% in the US, 98% in Japan concerned a negative impact on uh, our country's interests, even more than in Taiwan, which is 89%, and significantly high level of concern in, uh, in Korea, in India, uh, and in uh, Singapore. Notably, even in China, 43% uh, think that it would have a negative impact, uh, as opposed to 40 that would think that there would be a positive impact. Uh, now, to me, this, uh, this reflects, at least among the strategic elites in China, that they need to pursue peaceful development uh, strategy to win over the hearts and minds in, in Taiwan, that using coercive uh, measures would probably redound negatively uh, to Chinese interests. Uh, now, we don't have, of course, any data for comparison because we didn't ask this in 2009, uh, but my guess is that these uh, response rates for very negative uh, impact uh, are higher uh, than they would have been uh, in, in, in the past. And I think that there was a time that maybe some countries in the region might have seen Chinese coercion against Taiwan as a special case. That would not necessarily mean that China might use force or coercive measures against, for example, Philippines, Vietnam, other countries in Southeast Asia. But I think that that view has really changed. I think that's one of the things, things we are seeing in this uh, slide, that there's greater concern that if the mainland does use coercive measures against Taiwan, that this is going to be even more of a signal and evidence of China's willingness to use coercion uh, against some of its other neighbors. Very quickly on this, I would add to Bonnie's already excellent analysis that I think, to me, what was striking about this was it was also saying a lot about um, how everyone in the region valued U.S. credibility, because if you read the question the way it's written, it's presuming essentially that there's a course of reunification in which the United States either became militarily involved and failed or did not stop. And for that reason, it, I think it is sort of, it is also sort of a uh, uh, prism through which issues of U.S. credibility are refracted. No. So um, there, there's more actually in the packet and, and on our website. Um, again, we, we listed these nine findings as uh, things that in our discussions we thought stood out. 
Um, but uh, the main uh, advantage of this kind of survey we find is makes you think, makes you think comparatively across countries, it makes you think about regional dynamics, makes you think about expectations. Um, and uh, again, we want to thank um, Ernie Pakopoulos from uh, Opinion Dynamics and MacArthur for helping us pay for this and all my colleagues and, and their um, research fellows and staff. And let me now turn it over to you for questions, comments. We can always bring back up a slide if you'd like. Captain Nelson. Uh, thanks very much, Chris Nelson, Nelson Report. Uh, great discussion. I have to give a paper on all this in Berlin in about two weeks, so I'm going to cheerfully plagiarize a hell of a lot of what you were talking about. Um, a point that you made that really strikes home is uh, the difference between management and, and, and solution or solving. You know, it, we're all have a tendency to be liberal internationalists, small l. And you know, liberals kind of always believe that we can, we can really fix this. We can fix whatever it is. That's what we do. Uh, and maybe not uh, uh, some of these things, especially in history, especially in territory, without taking sides. So, so this is my question. In your poll, did you get a sense that uh, once you get outside of China, that even though the primacy of the uh, China economic relationship is what it is, that Asians want to see a more robust American military or strategic response to China's behavior? And if so, what, what are they talking about? Does it bother them they don't see the Seventh Fleet steaming through the Scarborough Shoals? You know, is that the kind of lesson they think they're drawing from quotes, our failure quotes in Syria and Ukraine, even though they're, you know, they're so different, you don't see how they do it, but that c keeps coming up in the commentary. Uh, uh, do Asians seem to want to see a more robust American strategic slash military response to the Chinese activities. Thank you. Let me do a first, first quick uh, stab at this. We didn't ask that question specifically. Um, let me also add, we didn't include, because we didn't have enough money, uh, Philippines, Vietnam, Mongolia, where we would have gotten even more reinforcing of this. Um, we want more of the American presence. Where we'd, on the other hand, we didn't include Russia, which frankly right now would trend in the other direction, I think it's safe to say. Um, uh, in terms of the specific military role, I can tell you um, it, it, it varies from country to country. I mean, in Northeast Asia, Japan and Korea want us to be very visible, very present vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. Japanese want us to be very visible and present vis-a-vis -vis China. South Koreans, not quite as much. <coughs> um, so it's going to vary from country to country. We, we, we won't have time to go through all of it. But the bottom line that comes out pretty clearly in this is that um, everybody wants more of us economically and in security. And although the Chinese respondents don't want more of us uh, in security, they clearly want more of us economically, as you saw in the question about economic partnership. Anybody can't do everybody, but. Well, I'd just say, you know, I mean, we did have the question, is the rebalance too confrontational to China? And that doesn't necessarily mean strategic military, but when I read the question, I think more of that than economic issues. And, you know, three countries in particular, India, Japan, and the United States, all viewed uh, they, they sort of voted that, uh, no, indeed, it was not too confrontational towards China, which you could read as saying they wish it were more so. And I think, you know, with India, like we look at, uh, we look at the, uh, the issues of confrontation that China has had on its borders um, to the east and the ocean, uh, but, uh, but actually, you know, last year there was this uh, issue in, in, in India, northern India, where uh, Chinese troops had crossed the border and camped out for a couple of weeks. And, you know, India didn't have very many tools to deal with that, and we weren't really in a position that I know of for the United States to intervene there. So, uh, you know, issues like that, you know, I think kind of India may actually want uh, a little bit of a ratchet up in confrontation. So they answered a strong no, we don't think the rebalance is too confrontational. So if you read it in the opposite, they might, they might appreciate it. And for Southeast Asia, Chris, I think you get um, sort of the opposite view that, that actually, you know, uh, U.S. economic engagement, a political foundation for American engagement being built in the United States, these are what they want to see to repel or, or moderate a China, what they see as an increasingly aggressive Chinese approach to their, to their sovereignty um, and, and the territorial disputes. So they don't, uh, the Southeast Asians don't want to see, um, you know, sort of guns um, and boots, um, but they, China is pushing them in some places like uh, the Philippines to, uh, to be more open to that. Um, but what, this is what I say, I keep saying, uh, economics is the foundation of security for the Southeast Asians. It's also a good reason why Southeast, the Southeast Asia, that ASEAN core, is a very, uh, it's a really intuitive uh, 
uh, core or fulcrum for regional um, regional strategy, security strategy. It doesn't replace uh, alliances, but it, it actually is a place where you can meet and, and, cr and shape uh, how the Chinese uh, might behave over time. Thanks. Um, I'm going to try to be, yes, Michael. I, know. Uh, I want to raise uh, two, two issues. One is uh, building on what uh, Mr. Bauer said. Uh, it seems that um, we should really think in terms of the uh, sort of liberal internationalist approach in a rather different way in the sense that um, uh, the emphasis in, the, in that approach is on obviously trade and economics and so on, and they see that values grow out of that. But I think what the lesson is from what I've been hearing and what I've felt for a long time is that for, I would say, all the Asian governments, the question of economics is central to the security of their governments internally. And it came out, I think, very much in uh, Sino-Japanese relations. Both sides recognized that their economic interdependence acted as a kind of restraint as to how far they would go. And so, in that sense, we have to think of economic relationships and interdependence much more in terms of the, sig the significance it plays in domestic politics. It's not just a question of, of values and so on. Uh, the second point I'd like to raise, it seems to me that um, one of the things that comes out, perhaps not uh, fully, is that the um, Chinese experts seem to be a little bit behind uh, their government. Uh, for example, I if you think of the recent major statements of Xi Jinping about foreign policy, it's very much Asia-centric with China in the middle, as it were. And there's very clear attempts to exclude the United States from the various frameworks he's thinking about. But it seems from what, from what your surveys suggest is that the Chinese experts still want to hold on to the relationship with the United States in a very significant and comprehensive way. Um, those are excellent points. Thank you, Michael. Um, I think you're right about the, the primacy of economics to security, uh, particularly for developing countries, but across the region. It was striking uh, that over 40% of Chinese experts thought historical issues could lead to military conflict. Um, so there's, a, there's an anxiety about this that's quite high, uh, but your point, I think, is right. Let me ask Chris and maybe Bonnie if they want on this question of of whether the Chinese respondents are a bit behind the elite. One thing we couldn't objectively measure, we can, we can uh, venture some opinions about, is um, how well these reflect government positions, and it may be in China less so than in the US, Australia, Japan, or Korea. I, I mean, I think there's, um, just based on my recent trips there, there is some sense that uh, they're not fully on board with the new approach uh, that the administration has been taking. They see it as dangerous, possibly counter, certainly counterproductive, possibly dangerous. Um, and something that uh, is not necessarily in China's long-term strategic interest. I also think that it does reflect the point I made earlier, though, that uh, because they're not sure yet how to conduct themselves as an maturing uh, international global power, there's a sort of clinging for what they know, which is the U.S. dominance. I really think that, and that comes out especially strongly among America hands inside China. So I think there might be a little bit of respondent bias in those uh, numbers, but that's just my own thought. I should add, we, we tried very carefully when we made this list to not just the Ameri ask the American hands. We, we, we tried um, to get a broader representation. But there is an ambivalence among the Chinese experts that comes out in this about Chinese power. And just one, one other point before Bonnie jumps in, I, I, coming back to the economics piece, it is about uh, economics is security and economics is also stability. I mean, I think one of the key points coming out of the U.S.-China uh, numbers in this is that it is indeed another indicator of how the economic relationship plays such an important role as a stabilizer and shock absorber in the bilateral relationship. I was just at, at the Shangri-La dialogue in Singapore, and many of the officials and experts uh, there cautioned that Xi Jinping's proposal 
uh, of Asia for Asians is not necessarily aimed at excluding the United States. And there seems to be uh, an, an effort to try and balance this view. Perhaps China just doesn't want to be seen as pushing out the United States or taking on a bigger role prematurely. Uh, but I think that they do understand that the rest of the region certainly doesn't want to see the U.S. Uh, pushed out. So maybe we should stay tuned for some clarification on that. And just to add uh, one point, again, from some of my discussions at the Shangri-La Dialogue in response to Chris Nelson's question, um, I think that there are great differences, perhaps, among the uh, Southeast Asian nations about U.S. military presence. But I would draw a distinction between a strong desire for quiet, persistent presence uh, as compared to what uh, some countries are worried about, a more confrontational presence, because they really don't want to see uh, real confrontation and friction between the U.S. and China. Uh, but continued U.S. presence, uh, particularly um, uh, freedom of navigation operations in uh, the South China Sea, I think receive very warm support. Can you have a microphone? Wait, Thanks. Microphone. Yeah. Uh, Gil Rosman. Victor, you talked about the uh, schizophrenia in Korea. I wonder if you look at the overall results of Japan and Korea on these nine questions and, and sub-questions, whether you see Japan and Korea drifting further apart, as in their views of CJK, or you see some signs that this, they, because they have so much in common, they can uh, overcome the aspects of difference? Um, I think on, um, and my colleagues can, um, may, may have a better recollection, when I think about the, the pair in terms of their responses to the questions, the biggest gap um, was on the, one of the slides we put up, which was who do you see as your important economic partner in the future? That was where the biggest gap was, where Koreans were, you know, 86% China and Japan is what, 70 some, 70 something percent US. But aside from that, on me most of the other questions in terms of how they saw um, um, uh, sort of the, the key issues for their national security and how they saw the economic institutions and uh, the regional institutions, there's a, there's a lot of symmetry between, um, between the respondents in, in um, in Korea and Japan. And then, of course, it's the history issue in which we see the biggest gulf. And I think that um, while I don't want to say that I, that's what I expected to see, because then it sounds like our surveys weren't that helpful, it was, <laughs> I, it, what it did do was it validated for me, for me my own assumptions, which were that, yes, you know, there are these very difficult history issues, but from sort of a realpolitik level, there is such a strong overlap between these two countries for policymakers, the question is, you know, can you still continue to forge pragmatic cooperation in spite of these history issues, which I don't think anybody believes are going to go away. They're not going to go away. You just try to cope, you try to get through them each time they come up. So, um, so in that sense, I thought the, the findings of the survey really provided some good empirical evidence for some of the assumptions that I held as a researcher of, of, of these relationships. So, so yeah. No. Yes, um, thank you uh, for uh, your research. And uh, as uh, I am interested in the uh, title order and power in Asia, I would be interested in uh, your view, uh, one of the panelists, about the uh, Chinese claim eagle shape in the whole uh, China, uh, South China Sea and East Sea, as a Vietnam uh, call. Uh, with that, uh, and as opposed to the uh, book uh, published by uh, Chinese government by 2019-12, that the border of China is only uh, to the Hainan Island. So that one is the most far south of China. So uh, uh, 100 years after they claim the sea territory for the whole part of that region. And uh, another uh, question is that uh, we all recognize the rising power of China, and it is a legitimate uh, uh, desire for China to uh, be a big power as a major nation in Asia. 
But how would the people in Asia think, or particularly the Chinese people, think about the leadership statement about the rising uh, power in China in a peaceful way, as opposed to their actions uh, over the last few years with Japan, with the Philippines, and now with Vietnam? Thank you. So Nick, remind me, we, we got uh, the survey Can results. Just identify Sorry, could you identify yourself, sir? I'm sorry, you're, would, would you tell us who you are and who you're with? Yes, uh, my name is Hai Ching, and uh, I am with the uh, uh, private consulting firm HTKH International. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you. Nick, uh, uh, remind me, but we, we um, had about a two, three week period to do the surveys. We didn't want too much time, because uh, then you'd have people responding to different events. But all the results were in before this um, uh, Chinese um, yeah. oil, rig. oil rig went out. So um, it, it, I suspect, based on the atmosphere in Shangri-La and other things, we might have had some even more pronounced responses uh, to China's power and uncertainty. But I don't know if uh, did you have this on a purpose? I don't know if, if, if Chris or Ernie or Marie want to weigh in on the specific issue. Chris, your mic's on. Did you watch it? No. Oh, okay. I'm Ben Self, I'm adjunct fellow here and at, at uh, GW. Um, I have a question about figure 10 for, for Mike and for Rick. Um, I just quickly tried to figure out an average level of uh, threat perception in each country. It's rather than average across on the issue versions, if you kind of figured an average up and down vertically to see how nervous these countries are about their security. Clearly, Australia and the United States stand out as very unconcerned. They're basically all green. Uh, India stands out as the most threatened. And so, Rick, I'm curious why India has such a high level of threat. It's averaging over seven um, in terms of how serious these issues are. But Mike, I wanted to ask you, um, Japan is under average, 6.1, 6.2 below the, the overall average slightly. Given recently Japanese have become much more concerned about their security environment, and you've written eloquently about this, what would you say explains this sort of lower level than average sense of threat perception by the Japanese compared with their neighbors in the region, not you know, necessarily Jap with the US or Australia? I have to think about that, so you can go first, Rick. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, luckily it breaks it down, so it's the, the answers, you know, uh, I mean, clearly terrorism. I mean, there's no question about what the single biggest threat that they've got from an externality. It happens relatively frequently at a low level, and occasionally you've got a Mumbai or a parliament attack that, uh, so, um, so that one. Uh, on climate change, you know, that one's a little tricky, right? I mean, because you, you think India, um, a, a, many in India say that, well, you know, America polluted heavily during its phase of economic growth. We're entering that phase right now. We should be given a little bit of leeway. Um, but I think with climate change, you know, what they may be specifically referring to is the fact that about 50% of India's working population is still in basic agriculture. And a good monsoon, a bad monsoon, things like that, is the single biggest impact on the majority of workers' lives. And so when you think about what impact that would then have on domestic politics, you know, when do things really destabilize if suddenly, you know, 50% of the people just don't know if they're gonna be able to grow an ear of corn the next year. Um, you know, human security needs, food, water security is, I think, relatively obvious, nat nat uh, lack of natural resources. So nothing, I think, that other than the climate change. That might be one where, you know, I think people would be a little bit surprised that they weigh that so heavily, but, but I think that probably, huh? The tsunami. The tsunami, yeah. I mean, they, they've got uh, real issues that, that, that pop up. I think Japan, I think Matt was, if I understood his gesticulating just now. I think one reason Japan is lost, if you look at the bottom, internal ethnic conflict is nowhere on the map. So, you know, that Ainu threat from Hokkaido, <laughs> uh, not a major concern. Um, so Japan, yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't know about Gaijin scholars living in Tokyo. That's another problem. So, um, you know, that probably brings Japan down a bit. But when it comes to the territorial disputes, Japan's right up there with Korea, China, and the others. Um, Japan's very low on climate change. Uh, actually, which is interesting for a country that was really, after all the Kyoto protocols were in Kyoto, uh, quite low. Um, I think that accurately reflects the mood in Japan right now, um, uh, post uh, 311, uh, and, uh, and frankly out of sync with where Washington is when it comes to things like coal. Uh, 
and other things. Matt, did I get your suggestion right? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you for putting together this um, this survey. Um, I just. Sorry, would you? I know who you are, but would you mind identifying yourself? Uh, sure, I should have sure. asked others. Uh, my name is Xue Yuan Xu. I work in the Chinese Embassy. Uh, I mean, thank you for putting this. Uh, together this survey. I find uh, uh, many findings are very interesting. Um, before I raise a question, I just ha want to add two facts on a comment uh, made by the so-called uh, China-centered uh, speech by President Xi Jinping. One is, uh, uh, fact is, China was the first nation that made the public statement that uh, China welcomed um, the United States to participate in EAS. The second fact is um, that the uh, platform uh, where uh, President Xi Jinping made that uh, speech considered by some uh, that uh, he means, uh, meant uh, China-centered, uh, it was not a uh, group that uh, is exclusive. Actually, many uh, countries, including the United States, at least is one of the uh, 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 observers. And my question is, I, I find the very, uh, in the, if you look at figure three and figure seven of this survey, you will find in figure three uh, that um, most of the countries um, uh, in Asia consider uh, China will be their most important economic partner uh, 10 years from now. And in figure seven, that the most of the countries uh, in Asia welcomes the um, policy of re rebalance policy of the United States, but they think uh, um, there is uh, something in in um, sufficient resource and implementation. I don't know whether this survey also um, covers uh, uh, the details of what are insufficient sufficient there um, by the uh, rebalance um, policy, or what do you think, um, uh, what is insufficient there? Thank you. Uh, thank you, and I would note that um, uh, I think with the exception of the question, what future order do you prefer, where um, only about 10 percent of the Chinese respondents said they wanted a U.S.-led order, with the exception of that, there's clear ambivalence about American uh, leadership in the regional order. With the exception of that, you get a strong sense that Chinese experts are welcome, if I can say it, cohabitation in Asia with the United States. Uh, it doesn't come out in our results that there's, a, there's a, uh, um, a, 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 anything like a consensus or even a strong minority view that China somehow has to push the U.S. out of Asia. That does come through. Chris, do you want to weigh on on this? Well, I just, I think we've been talking, the theme that's been running through our, all of our comments today is, is what's uh, missing from the rebalance, if you will, right? And I think it's the trade stuff that Ernie referred to earlier. It's the uh, sort of questioning about, you know, now that we have the policy, what's the next step? You know, we've talked a lot, I think, among us on the panel about next steps in these various areas. And so I think that's reflective. I also think that it's uh, reflective of the fact that, as you were saying earlier, Mike, there's just more demand across the board for the U.S. presence. If you look at the, um, the Councilor Shui pointed out figure seven, which is this box, and you'll, you know, you, you'll find that the blue dots in the lower right, the countries that expressed where experts expressed the most concern, are all uh, TPP partners, U.S. allies, or countries that in the survey expressed the most concern about China's rise. Um, so I think that begins to answer the question about sufficiency of resources. Thailand is a complete anomaly in every one of these questions. We only have about one minute left, but I wonder if we could conclude maybe by putting the spotlight on Ernie and Murray to explain. <laughs> uh, this, by the way, was true last time, too. The, the Thai responses were really out of um, out of step with, um, with the rest of the region. On, they're just a unique, independent-minded people, I suppose, but very different answers to these questions than other U.S. allies uh, or Mike, even I think countries. I think, you've, I think you've answered the question. <laughs> uh, no, I think, look, I think a lot of this has to do with, with Thailand's own feeling of um, uh, sort of disappointment in, the, in what they assumed was a, a very strong uh, and vibrant U.S. relationship. Uh, the Thais really don't forget uh, uh, when you're inconsistent with them. Um, and um, I hate to generalize like that, but it's true. 
uh, they, they really do uh, carry around uh, a very strong feelings as a country over uh, the U.S. response to the financial crisis, which they felt was uh, very antiseptic. And, um, and then you can't win after that because Thailand began to polarize. And our response to the coup in, uh, in 2006 uh, really alienated at least half the Thais, okay? You know, so, uh, and I think um, that's a problem. The other problem is that they are, some, I think Murray explained this earlier, these guys are really focused on themselves right now. Um, and, it, and it's existential. An existential, you know, once in a hundred year sort of reordering of power uh, that's underway in Thailand. And that's what they're focused on. So I, I, I'm not surprised Thailand had some anomalous uh, responses. I, I think if we do this survey and, you know, after things settle, which I can't tell you what the X is, um, <laughs> that uh, Thailand will be uh, closer to a blueberry uh, than uh, whatever that yellow thing is up there right now. So um, let me thank my colleagues. It's been great. Uh, uh, great fun drawing on everyone's expertise in designing and interpreting this. Thank you for your comments. I, we would certainly ri welcome written comments if you want to send them in. Um, we may post some of it on our, uh, if you're interested, on our blog site, Cogit Asia. But thank you all very much for coming today.